Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Kenny Harrell. I'm the managing partner of the Joy Law Firm, and today I am uh, very pleased to be joined with my good friend and colleague, Allison Sullivan, uh, with the Bluestein uh, Firm. And uh, we want to talk to you about uh, what's a pretty significant development, at least for some of our clients, uh, with what the, the Navy, uh, the Navy Claims Department and the Department of Justice released, I guess, a week ago, Allison, right. uh, with yeah. the selective option uh, settlement proposal. Um, you know, just a refresher, uh, and this is intended for our clients, uh, as I think we have told all of you, the first step uh, in these cases is the filing of the administrative claim with the Department of the Navy. And for really over the past year, I think most lawyers around the country that are involved in these cases, we kind of felt like the Navy was just, you know, sort of asleep at the wheel and kind of put their head in the sand and uh, they were going to just ignore uh, these claims and let the uh, sort of let the clock run out um, because we have to give them at least six months to respond. Uh, but as we found out last Wednesday, they haven't been completely asleep at the wheel uh, because uh, they they dropped this on us. And when I say they dropped it on us, uh, this caught uh, lawyers around the country by surprise. We had no part in working with them to develop this, uh, this elective option settlement proposal, which will give some people at least the option of an earlier settlement as opposed to going through litigation. So, uh, Allison, you know, your your initial thoughts about what uh, what we're dealing with now? Yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic that this is the step in the in the right direction, Kenny. Um, you know, we've been hard at work over the last year gathering as much information as we possibly can on these claims in anticipation of this day, uh, a, a point in time in this process where the Navy would be ready to start talking to us. Uh, about resolution of these claims. I mean, uh, uh, many of these people have been um, waiting decades for this day to come, for the for the Navy to finally acknowledge what happened at Camp Lejeune and finally acknowledge the injuries that were caused by the toxic water. My, my cautiousness, however, comes from um, the same thing I've been uh, we've been telling our clients for the last year is that the Navy has not set up any sort of system to date where we can supply any support, any type of supportive documentation for these claims. They've been unwilling to accept any uh, supporting medical records, any supporting service records. And to date, there still isn't that system in place. So I'm 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 cautiously optimistic by announcing this plan or this program that they announced last week. So that means that perhaps there's some sort of system in the background where they can now start going through these claims um, and start evaluating them for 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 payment, um, at least some of the claims under the program that we're going to talk about here in a moment. Yeah, sounds good. Well, let's let's dive right in, and uh, Alice and I will, will each kind of cover different topics, and I'm sure you know we can add our own uh, comments as well, uh, in, you know, after each of these uh, topic summaries, but. I want to start with, you know, what are the qualifying injuries to even be eligible uh, to consider this program? Um, I, I would say that of our clients, uh, probably 75 percent of our clients uh, will not have a condition covered by this uh, elective option uh, settlement proposal. And so uh, that doesn't mean that you don't have a case um, if you don't have uh, one of these conditions that's uh, part of uh, this proposal. It just means that you're not going to have the option uh, of the early settlement. Uh, they have divided uh, the conditions that are covered into two tiers. Uh, tier one, which they put a little bit higher value on, and then tier two uh, conditions. Uh, they didn't just you know, pull these conditions out of the, the air. Uh, there was a, a federal agency that deals with toxic substances and diseases. They had identified specific conditions that they felt like uh, that there was evidence supporting a causal connection between the contaminants in the water at Camp Lejeune and developing these conditions. And uh, with one exception, pretty much everything that was on that list is a part of this uh, elective option proposal. Uh, the tier one conditions uh, are kidney cancer, liver cancer, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, leukemias, uh, and bladder cancer. And then for the tier two conditions, uh, multiple myeloma, uh, Parkinson's, uh, kidney disease, end stage uh, renal disease, and then a pretty rare condition. In fact, Allison, I don't know if we have a, a client that I've seen that's got uh, this last condition, but systemic sclerosis or systemic uh, scleroderma. Um, the, the one condition that was uh, included in that federal agency's uh, findings that is not a part of this early settlement option 
would be cardiac birth defects. Uh, the, the Navy said in their memo, and, and, and while this was a joint release by the Navy and the Department of Justice, we, we have every reason to believe that this was really the Navy Claims Department's work. And what they indicated is that it, that was just too complex of a condition for them to include it uh, in the early option. Uh, again, just want to really can you know reiterate: just because you don't have one of these conditions, you know, perhaps you've got colon cancer uh, or you know male breast cancer or, or a host of other conditions. That we feel like that there very well could be scientific evidence that will support a causal connection, and the evidence continues to develop uh, almost daily, certainly weekly, uh, as these uh, conditions get looked at now. Uh, but but don't despair if if you're not uh, on the list. Uh, you know you've got to have, of course, the duration of exposure that the law requires, which is at least thirty days uh, between August 1, 1953, and December thirty one, uh, nineteen eighty seven. Um, and they do indicate that uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, that would also include uh, the New River uh, Air Station. Um, so if you were there, that, that is definitely going to be uh, covered. And then the, the last thing that I would note about the qualifying injuries is they've really given zero consideration to um, the severity of the condition or what, uh, you know, how the individual with the condition has been impacted. I mean, I know, Alton, we've seen people with the exact same conditions, some people have had their lives just turned completely upside down uh, because of the severe side effects. And others, um, you know, they, you know, it's obviously stressful to know, for example, if you've got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, to know that you've got this blood-borne cancer. But there are some people that have pretty much been able to continue on with their uh, regular lives just getting that condition monitored. But uh, that's an overview of what's going to be covered, and uh, and I'll. Allison, any other thoughts? And then she's going to talk to you about uh, the payments grid that they've set up. Well, and that's that's the question, right? People want to say, well, how much are they going to offer me for these for these claims? So they if you fall into one of those tiers that Kenny just covered, um, they're going to fall into one of two categories. And the categories are divided based upon how much time you were exposed to the toxic water at Camp Lejeune. So as you'll see on your screen here, if you have a tier one qualifying injury and you were there for a minimum of 30 days, and those days do not have to be consecutive. Those days could be uh, we've had some clients that would you know, be there for a couple of weeks for some training, go back home and then maybe go back to Lejeune six months later, do a couple more weeks of training throughout the course uh, of a couple of years. But just 30 days minimum up to 364 days, so just less than a year. They will, no questions asked, if you can provide evidence that you had that condition and we can provide evidence uh, that you were there for that period of time, they will offer you $150,000 to resolve the claim. If you have one of those tier two qualifying injuries that Kenny just discussed, you would be entitled to $100,000, okay? Um, if the period of time is one to five years for a tier one qualifying injury, the Navy will bump their offer up to $300,000 for a tier one. And for a tier two claim, you would be eligible for $250,000. Um, if you were there for more than five years, this is where they're paying the top dollar uh, under this program. If you're there for more than five years for a tier one qualifying injury, they will offer $450,000. For a tier two qualifying injury, they're going to offer you $400,000, okay? Now, those are offers that are made to people that um, have survived and are still with us um, who were exposed to the toxic water. If you are bringing a, a claim on behalf of a loved one who has passed away as a result of one of those qualifying injuries, the Navy will increase the offer by an additional $100,000, now, Kenny, our understanding of, of these offers, these are not up to offers, meaning we will offer you up to $150,000 or up to $300,000. These are flat payments, $150,000. Um, I'm sorry, $100,000 on the, on the minimum end for a Tier 2 qualifying injury, up to $550,000 for a Tier 1 qualifying injury that involves death. Um, I will note, Kenny, um, it has been our experience with the clients that we represent. We could, it is a very small percentage of our clients who are at Camp Lejeune for, uh, for more than five years. Um, mm -hmm. The bulk of the clients were there, at minimum of 30 days, probably about six months 
up to around the two to three year mark. Um, that's that's kind of the biggest cluster of exposures that we are seeing. Um, but but we do not believe there will be very many clients at all that would qualify for um, for benefits under that top tier, which would be more than five years of exposure. Yeah, I, I you know, also I've kind of described that in some ways almost as window dressing because right. it, it, it makes them look as if they're, you know, making uh, more generous proposals. Uh, you know, by and large, um, you know, particularly as I've you know, gone around, you and I have met with a lot of clients. I mean, I, I meet with somebody that's, you know, suffered with bladder cancer for years. Uh, I have to say, you know, our gut instinct is these numbers seem to be on the low end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, on a case by case basis, we'll just have to determine uh, if our client's covered, whether or not it would make sense for them to consider it. In some cases, the answer may well be yes, based on a whole host of factors. Um, but clearly, I think what the Navy is, trying to do and of course you know you can't fault them they're doing their job they're trying to get uh as many of the you know i guess would, would be the most valuable cases resolved frankly for figures that would strike us to be pretty conservative uh, on the low end you know, of what the settlement value would be well and there's one other big qualifying factor um that has to do with the date of diagnosis related to the period of time um that you were ex- the last time that you were exposed to the toxic water Absolutely. And, and that's that's part of uh, the other requirements for participating. And I'll, I'll kind of go through those. But that's the biggest one, Alex, and I'll definitely spend the most time talking about that. Uh, but here, what are the other requirements? I mean, you've got the condition. You were there at least 30 days. Um, but that's not it. You don't stop there. Uh, you, you do still have to you know, submit an administrative claim to the Navy Claims Department first to be considered for this program. Uh, that could still be a very complicated process, particularly if it's a wrongful death, because they're not going to accept uh, a wrongful death administrative claim if you don't have somebody that's uh, duly appointed as the personal representative of the estate. And as we have found out, uh, that is a pretty uh, arduous process in some instances to, to get somebody in place to serve in that role. But the the real uh, uh, kicker, and, and I, I've talked to a number of our clients that, frankly, this looks like the element that may disqualify them for, from consideration for this uh, elective option early settlement, and that is the onset or latency requirement. Because under this proposal, uh, you would not be eligible for the early settlement uh, if your diagnosis uh, was less than two years uh, from the date of your last exposure to the contaminants in the Camp Legion water. Um, and, and there's a few instances where we will run into that, but but the real kicker, uh, it also cannot be more your di- your diagnosis or first date of treatment for the condition can't be more than 35 years after your last exposure to the water. So, using an example, you know, somebody leaves Camp Lejeune in 1970, and then lo and behold, in 2010, they get diagnosed with bladder cancer. Well, as this is written, as this is proposed. Uh, that individual is not going to be eligible uh, for the elective option because their diagnosis was more than 35 years after their last exposure to the water. So, again, we're just going to have to go through these cases on a uh, case-by-case basis. You know, other uh, requirements, just briefly, of course, they're requiring that medical documentation confirm uh, the condition that is covered, and you must have been diagnosed or treated before August 10 of 2022, uh, which is the date that this a law took effect. Um, they are for the duration of exposure. They want to have housing or employment uh, documentation showing that the claimant uh, was either stationed uh, at Camp Lejeune or, or worked at Camp Lejeune. And, you know, we've run into some situations, Allison, where just because of the passage of time, that it may be difficult to obtain these documents. And we've discussed, well, you know, we'll just rely on affidavits. I mean, we'll, we'll get an affidavit from our clients or from other people who may have known them. And very, you know, they very pointedly have said sworn affidavits are not going to be sufficient uh, to establish uh, the duration of exposure uh, for these claims. So that's a, a little bit of a heightened uh, requirement uh, for death claims. Again, you've got to have medical documentation confirming that the death was uh, linked or related uh, to the, uh, the covered condition. So it, it's not just a matter of having the condition and having been there. Uh, there are other requirements. And so, again, and we'll keep stressing this, Allison, it really will be a case-by-case determination for us. That's right, Kenny. And and there is one other part of the program that kind of caught my eye that I think is is an intriguing 
um, element to this elective um, resolution process, and that has to do with the waiver of the VA offsets. Mm-hmm. So we this question has popped up time and time and time again. Um, in part, I think there's there was a lot of confusing and conflicting information that had been released by a variety of different groups as far as are my VA disability benefits going to be affected? Um, can they, you know, will they terminate my benefits while I lose my access to health care? And the answer to that is a, resolve, a resounding no. The way the act is drafted is your recovery on the Camp Lejeune Justice Act side, on the litigation side, may be reduced by amounts that you received through the VA disability system for conditions related to your exposure to Camp Lejeune. So if you're getting $2,000 a month and um, $500 of that is related to one of the, the conditions related to your exposure at Lejeune, then however much money you've you've received, you know, for that $500 a month, w- may be re- uh, your Camp Lejeune Justice Act recovery may be reduced by that amount that you received for your VA disability benefits, okay? Mm-hmm. The amount that uh, the VA paid for medical treatment related to that condition may be reduced from your Camp Lejeune Justice Act recovery. It doesn't work the other way. They're not going to suspend your VA disability benefits. They're not going to say that you received an overpayment from your VA disability benefits, you will not have to pay any money back from your VA disability benefits. Your VA disability benefits will not be suspended. They will not be just um, jeopardized. Mm -hmm. Um, As I explained to our clients, our firm has been representing veterans uh, with their VA disability claims since 2007. We are acutely aware of how important those benefits are to people, both financially And symbolically, you worked really hard and went through a lot to get those benefits. We will not do the first thing that will jeopardize your VA disability benefits. Okay, but the act does allow for a reduction on your Camp Lejeune Act recovery. For benefits that you received on the VA disability side. Okay, what this program is is doing is it says we will waive any any rights to an offset that we can recover. So in some cases, um, that could that could be a valuable waiver that would increase the total value of the package. Um, and again, that just kind of underscores the importance of going through these claims individually. For some of our clients, this program will make a lot of sense. For other of our clients, it will not make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for a vast majority of our clients, will not even qualify um, right. for the reasons that we've talked about. Either you don't have a qualifying condition or you've got a latency problem. Um, But for those that do qualify, we'll go through them on an individual basis and figure out who it makes sense for, who it doesn't. And at the end of the day, it's our client's um, decision to make. Our job is to advise and counsel and advocate. Um, But at the end of the day, it will be our client's decision um, and your decision on saying you, speaking to the client on Mm -hmm. what you want to do under this program. Yeah, that that's a great point, Allison, because that has been such a big concern for so many of our clients. Like, hey, I don't do anything that's going to screw up the benefits that I'm getting, uh, whether it's the service member or you know the, could be the widow of a service member that's getting uh, a survivor's benefit. Um, and, and again, for the set off, you know, do understand that the set off uh, would only apply if the disability benefits have been specifically linked to right. your exposure to the, the water, uh, you know, the contaminated water at Camp Lejeune. Uh, we have a number of people that are getting VA disability benefits, but nothing that's, uh, that's you know stated that it's related to the Camp Lejeune uh, water exposure. But it could be a big issue. I, mean, I just met with a client a couple of weeks ago, and it, 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 his uh, benefits have been specifically linked to the Camp Lejeune uh, water contamination. He's got a uh, diagnosed uh, blood cancer, and by his calculation, he's like, "Look, you know, it looks like I have received in the neighborhood of three hundred thousand dollars of benefits." Uh, so this would be a, a significant consideration uh, in some of our cases. So um, you know, that's a great point. You know, just real quickly, uh, settlement procedures. You know, let's say you do qualify. We we do the granular dive on the facts of your case. We weigh all the pros and cons, and then after giving our input, uh, you know, you decide, hey, I want to move forward uh, with the early resolution and to take uh, this amount that uh, is being made available to me. Um, you know, what would happen? Well, uh, the Navy uh, still has to uh, you know, prepare uh, the offers and then have the Department of Justice 
uh, sign off on it. Uh, so the DOJ gets uh, sort of approval. They have to confirm qualification. And at that point, the Navy would then notify the claimant, hey, we, we're making this proposal. Uh, the claimant will then have 60 days uh, to accept or deny uh, this uh, early settlement uh, proposal. If there's no response, the Navy does have the right to basically say, okay, we, we deem your claim to be uh, denied. And if the claimant accepts uh, the selective option offer, uh, they are then uh, going to be required from the date of acceptance to sign the settlement documents uh, within 14 days. Um, and payment is supposed to be processed within 60 days, which is relatively expedited. Uh, we've certainly right. had instances where it's taken uh, much longer. So that's just a few procedures. And, and I guess we'll just end with a few uh, closing thoughts, you know, just a few other points that I think are, are pertinent. And Allison, I'll let you have the last word. Uh, one thing about the selective option uh, proposal, they are using a base-wide approach. You know, we're very aware of the fact that there are certain uh, places on the base, certain areas like Hadnot Point, uh, Tower of Terrace, um, Oakham Boulevard, where the exposure levels would have been higher uh, based on where the you know the, the aquifers uh, were. Uh, but this, they're not looking at that uh, at all. It's just if you were on the base, uh, you got the condition, uh, then uh, you, you could qualify. Again, I think a big one, you know, no consideration given to not only the severity of the illness, uh, but also, you know, if you, uh, you know, lost income, uh, no uh, consideration given to what the amount of your medical bills have been. So, you know, somebody could have gone through multiple surgeries, could have hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills. Somebody else, you know, maybe had $20,000 of medical bills, but they're not giving any uh, consideration uh, to that. Uh, and then if you have more than one qualifying uh, condition, because we certainly have clients, you know, for example, clients that have both bladder cancer and Parkinson's, uh, you know, the question would be, well, can I recover twice? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, you know, they've specifically said that uh, there's only one payment uh, for one condition. But if you do have, uh, you know, a tier one condition like bladder cancer and a tier two condition such as Parkinson's, they will pay at the, you know, the higher tier one uh, level. But it, again, uh, it, you know, we're here, uh, you know, to give you input, give you advice. We will just have to do a case by case analysis because, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start initially by saying, all right, well, who of our clients is eligible to even consider it? And then we can start to do sort of the granular uh, factual review to see, you know, what our recommendation would be. Um, Allison, I'll let you close us out. Well, I'll just reiterate kind of what I said before. We are cautiously optimistic and cautiously encouraged by, by this program. We think it's a step in the right direction. But as Kenny just touched on, um, they are compromised settlement values. And, and in my opinion, um, in a lot of cases, don't begin to, to adequately compensate people for the harms and losses that they've suffered um, as a result of this, this toxic um, exposure that they've, they've been a victim to. Um, but, you know, that said, it, it's the first it's the thing we've been waiting on for a long time. Um, the first concrete step toward toward bringing some of these cases um, to a close, and so that's that's exciting, um, you know, because that means there's there's going to be more steps coming um, mm -hmm. down the road as far as timelines for that, what those processes will look like. Um, there has been a lot of um, movement behind the scenes as far as what's been happening on the litigation side with the development of a of a leadership council that's working actively with the Department of Justice and working with the courts um, to figure out how to move these cases along. Um, and, and, and so there's there's movement going on behind the scenes, but this is the first kind of concrete public facing action that we've seen taken by the Navy in a positive direction. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Allison, thank you. And uh, as always, if you have questions, mm -hmm. you've got our numbers. Um, we can't stress that enough. Um, you know, people say to us, it's, we don't want to bother you. This is our job. We're here to help. If you've got a question, please pick up the phone and call us. Thank you. Thanks, y'all.